Let's enter in prayer together. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we have this time that we can set aside, where we can come before you, come before your throne of grace. We can experience your Spirit's presence. May you bless us, Lord, as we have this time. May you draw us near to you, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to invite you to stand. As we open our service singing, the holiness of the Lord.
that part of our worship together is not only in our singing and our praying, but also in offering of ourselves to the Lord. And as a part of that, the offering of our tithes and financial resources. We do have 
plates at the back and at the front. Uh, the Lord has laid upon you to give towards the work of his ministry here at Memorial and beyond throughout this community. Let's pray for the Lord's blessing on these offerings. Almighty God, out of the many blessings you have poured out on us, so now we give back to you. Take these gifts and let them be more in your hands than they could ever be in ours. Use them to spread your word, your love, and your kingdom throughout Lake Placid and to the ends of the earth. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll stand together once more. <laughs>
Lord, you have poured out your love to us in unimaginable, unfathomable riches. Lord, the depths of your love for us, we can barely begin to process. And yet you continue to pour out your love and your grace upon us. Lord, shape us to be a people that would share that love and that grace, that forgiveness, that reconciliation, that salvation with all of those around us. Use us, Father God, to be a light and a witness for you as individuals and as a congregation, Lord. Use us to reach those who do not yet know you. Lord, there are many that you've put in our lives already, and we lift them up to you in this time. Those who don't know you or those who have fallen away, Father God, draw them to you. Draw them home to you. And where you see fit, use us to speak a word, to plant a seed, to water something put there by those past, or even to bring home the harvest to you. Lord, we lift up to you those who are ministering throughout this community. We lift up to you the other churches in this community and ask likewise that you would shape and mold them, that we might be the body of Christ together, not lifting up individual kingdoms, but Lord, being your kingdom here on earth. Lord, work in the ministries beyond the local church, work in Man Ministries, in Potter's House, in Hui, in Youth for Christ, in uh, the Circles in Costa Rica and the orphanage there. Father God, work through these that uh, to the ends of the earth your name might be known. Work in Lakeview Christian School, Father God, and lift up these students to you and ask that you would minister to them, that you would draw them to yourself. Lord, that you would use these teachers and this administration, Father God, to meet these kids not just with a solid foundation and academics, but also with the gospel, Father God, that they would come to know you most of all as Lord and Savior. Father God, we lift up to you uh, the needs of this community. Lord, we lift up to you our moms, and we thank you so much for those who have been a reflection of your love, your self-sacrificing love and grace. Lord, we thank you so much for them, and we ask for your blessings on them this day. Lord, we lift up to you those who are in need. We lift up to you the, the continued fires and things going on around our nation, Father God, and we ask for protection for those in harm's way, and especially for those who are battling these blazes. Lord, we lift up to you uh, Jody, who has uh, broken her wrist and will be seeing the orthopedic surgeon this week. Lord, we ask for your healing on her. We ask for relief from pain, and Father God, we ask for a speedy and full recovery. Lord, we lift up to you those battling cancer and those battling COVID and those battling all kinds of challenges. We continue to lift up to you the, the Heckman family, Charlie Reynolds, and, and so many others, Father God, who are in need of your ongoing love and care. Lord, we lift these up to you and ask that you will meet all of these needs according to your will and your great riches and glory. Father God, we ask that you will walk with us throughout this week, that you will show us how to walk in your ways, how to see the traps of the world, the flesh, and the devil for what they are, and to steer clear. Forgive us when we fail, Father God, and show us how to offer that grace and forgiveness to others around us as well. Lead us in your ways, guide us in your steps, that in all things we might bring glory to your name. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
rise with us as we join in singing this chorus of faith that God is worthy of our praise. Scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Colossians, chapter 1. Uh, we'll be starting in verse 15. I encourage you to follow along in your own Bibles. Uh, we'll be up on the screens as well, but uh, we may end up uh, going back into some other verses while we're at it. So keep it open when we're done. We're not done just when we finish reading. Uh, and if you don't have a good Bible to read out of, if you're looking for a resource, whether it be a, a Bible to read at home, whether it be a good app to read it on your phone uh, or your tablet, please let us know. We want to make sure to get those resources into your hands so you're able to read this word for yourself. So hear God's word this morning. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind to doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, 
which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, as we open up your word this morning, we ask that you will speak to us. Lord, whatever it is we need to hear this morning, you know. You know our hearts, you know our minds, you know our struggles. So come, Holy Spirit, and speak to us at the point of our need and confirm your word in our lives this morning. Tune our minds, our ears, and our hearts to know your voice and to tell it apart from all others. Speak to us, God. Use whatever words I may offer, but you speak to us. That we may know and do your will and yours alone. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Amen. Does what we believe matter? Does it? Well, yeah. <laughs> Sermon's over. Thanks. <laughs> it's always my family in the corner. Um, it doesn't matter. Here's the thing is that I, I think we can clearly say that it does, but there are voices in our culture right now and within Christianity right now that say, eh, maybe. It kind of does. It matters that you believe it. It matters that you believe strongly about something. But for the most part, what we believe doesn't have to all be the same thing for us to be good people, at least. That's the voice in our culture and in many Christian circles today. We've, we've done this in many ways out of a desire to avoid fights. And to be fair, there are things that we can live and let live, and, and that we oftentimes in the church have picked fights over that maybe we didn't need to. I, I know there have been numerous conversations over the years about how do we baptize, and, and Scripture is woefully lacking in detail on that point. Do we walk them into the water and dump them fully? Do we walk them halfway into the water and pour more over their head? Do we just skip to the good part and get the top of their head wet and not mess with putting the pool in the sanctuary? Yeah. Scripture doesn't really give us a lot of detail on that one. But many times we've gotten in debates and arguments over how do we do it, when do we do it, and why do we do it. Worship styles. What instruments should we have leading worship? Guitars, pianos, organs? Nothing at all. I got in a uh, discussion with someone one time who said that because there are no instruments in worship in the Bible, that we shouldn't have any instruments in church. And my first argument was, have you read the Psalms? <laughs> I said, there's, there's cymbals, there's tambourines, there's lyres. They said, oh, that's the Old Testament, doesn't count. <laughs> that's how you get me mad. Um, <laughs> I, I unfortunately wasn't thinking fast enough because there are trumpets in Revelation. Oh, that's true. <laughs> um, but those end kind of cataclysmically, so maybe not. But we end, up, we end up debating things that the Bible doesn't really give a clear definition to, and so a lot of times we've said, well, let's not, let's not fight over this. Let's not argue over these things. We don't need to worry about this stuff. Let's just, let's just all get along. Except that more and more of these days, we find we're differing over the things that do matter and not able to discuss it. The problem comes when we start disagreeing over things that Scripture is plain about that have been agreed on for centuries. And people say, well, let's just live and let live. Let's just get along. And indeed, that's the word of our age. Just live your truth. I got into a conversation with somebody just prior to Easter about the cross, and, and they claimed that uh, the cross is not a payment for some kind of spiritual transaction between God and humans, and, and the language of that was a little rough to begin with, but I was just like, well, I'm speaking with a, another believer in here is my understanding, and so I said, you know, the cross is payment for our sins, an atoning and willing sacrifice, and his response was, well, that's one view. But definitely not the only one. And, and 
we went on and, and started talking about this more. And I, I, I said to him, I'm like, you know, the, Jesus is fulfilling the sacrificial system with his death on the cross. Everything in scripture is, pointing, is po pointing to the cross being a sacrifice for our sins. You go all the way back into Genesis. You look at the, the ram uh, that was replaced for Isaac. You look at all these different places throughout scripture. It's all pointing to Jesus doing for us. And his response, was, and I'm saying this is the core of our faith. And his response was, it's the core of yours, perhaps. This is out there. Within various circles within Christianity, it's not just that we question the, the fringe stuff, should we have drums or not in worship, it's that people are now calling into question the very heart of salvation itself. Another uh, recently cited, uh, the, um, uh, we're at the 100th anniversary of a, of a sermon that called Shall the Fundamentalist Win by a guy named Harry Emerson Fosdick. And, and this was being lifted up and celebrated on its 100th anniversary. And, and in this sermon, and it was being lifted up by a clergy person within this denomination, in fact. Uh, the, the sermon uh, itself goes on to say that, uh, and, and take issue with certain things that uh, we might call conservative or orthodox or fundamentalist doctrines. Uh, namely things about, uh, let's see here, uh, the fact that uh, certain miracles were historical, like the virgin birth of our Lord, uh, that the scriptures are inspired, uh, that uh, the blood of our Lord shed in a substitutionary death uh, pays for our sins and what makes possible their welcoming home. I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, that we must believe that the Jesus will be returning. And speaks of these things in a negative light as, well, they're trying to pick fights around these things and say that these are the limiters of Christianity. And who are they to say that if you don't believe in the atonement of Jesus on the cross, the virgin birth, etc., that you can't be a Christian? Well, like 2,000 years of Christianity has been saying that. The problem is, he goes on to say, not that people hold these beliefs, but that they insist that they are necessary for salvation. And frankly, this is not a new conversation. It's not a new problem. In the earliest days of the church, when we were just getting started, there were still people who were eyewitnesses to Jesus' death and resurrection, walking around and talking to people in churches and saying, look what I saw with my own eyes. Even then, there were people going around saying, well, that's not quite what Jesus came here to do. And I'm going to tell you what he really came here for. If you'll buy my book. No. Um, <laughs> but we had all of these ideas floating around, and uh, some of them were cultural accommodations. They were trying to make the gospel sound better to people so that it would be more acceptable. So there were versions of Christianity where you still had to follow all of the Jewish law, all of it, all the ones that even the Jews couldn't follow. All of it in order to be saved. Because the whole idea of the gospel was really rubbing the Jews the wrong way and we wanted to make it accessible, or somebody wanted to make it accessible to them. Except in doing so undercuts the whole point that we couldn't uphold the law and we needed Christ. Others tried to accommodate it to Greek philosophy and Gentile mindsets and, and created these elaborate mythologies around it that, that uh, played into categories from Greek philosophy, talking about the difference between the material world and the spiritual world, between uh, the flesh and the soul. And some of these categories still pop up in how we talk about things today. But they saw these as wholly different. And so Jesus coming to save us couldn't have come in the flesh because the Holy Spirit, the spiritual, could not take on the broken, sinful material. And that aligned with the Greek philosophies of the day, that material, bad, spirit, good. 
And so they tried to change the gospel to fit that. But it kind of misses the point that God came in the flesh to save us from our sins. We see Paul, as he's writing to the church in Colossae, dealing with some of these issues and these questions. In fact, many of the things that Paul ends up writing are dealing with where people got off track whether they were trying to accommodate to the culture, whether they were taking on too many of the values of the word, world, whether they got locked in on a single point and missed the bigger picture. But these are the things that gave us some of the most beautiful statements about our faith as well. Paul is writing to deal with problems in these churches and in the process lays out for us understandings of the nature of salvation so that you and I today, not eyewitnesses to the resurrection, can still understand and proclaim what the earliest believers saw with their own eyes. We have the creeds, uh, the Apostles' Creed in their life that were written to clarify hey, this is what we understand to be true. And many of them were written against things that were being falsely taught. We lose track of some of those things. We don't necessarily know that when we're saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. We say those things as statements of belief today, but many of them were written to clarify against other versions that were being told. That Jesus was not even born into this earth, that he was just a spirit, or that he was just a human being and not God, or that he was born completely of human parents and elevated to Godhood in some form or fashion. We have these things, the creeds in order to be able to clarify this is what happened. Even the formation of our scriptures themselves in many ways were to try to clarify, hey, this is what is true against what others were writing because there were a lot of other versions floating out there. It was just, it was only slightly harder back then to put your, your version of the story out there and get it read by a whole bunch of people. The internet was a little harder to access at that time. But nevertheless, you could write a letter, say it was by Peter, and pass it around. And so the early church started developing lists to say, hey, these are the books we know to be true. These are the books that we confirm, we can confirm they were written by Peter, by Paul, by John. And so we can say for certain that what they contain is true, which gave us what we have in the scriptures today through the work of the Holy Spirit. And in the letter that we're reading today to the Colossians, we have here Paul giving us this amazing statement about the nature of who Jesus is to ground us in what is true so that we can then live in Christ properly. There are those who would say that uh, all of this stuff, you know, all of this theology stuff, it's kind of an academic matter. It doesn't really hit the ground. The, you know, you pastors and, and, and theologians, and that's, that's your territory. We just want to live our lives down here on the ground as Christians. Except Paul didn't see it that way either. If we go back into verse 9, he says this. And so from the day we heard... We have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. So he's saying here, 
We're praying for you to understand, to be filled with the knowledge of God's will, with spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. When we don't understand rightly who God is and what he has done, it can have ramifications on how we live out our Christian life. When we were going through the letters of John back in the fall, I, I said to you guys, and, and, and we're seeing it rise up more and more, if you've got people who are teaching different ways of walking the Christian life, go and check what their fundamentals are. Go and check what the core doctrine is that they're teaching. What do they believe about Jesus? And maybe they would just disagree on some finer points. But go back and look. Look at their teaching. Look at their writing. Look at their preaching. Are they proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Are they proclaiming him as fully God and fully human? Are they proclaiming that the resurrection really happened, that he really died on the cross for our sins? Or are they watering him down to a good teacher, as many do today? For many that Paul was dealing with, they would de-emphasize the cross and say that in order to be saved and, and, and attain spiritual protection, okay, the cross was great, but you really got to get these laws down and live by them. Or, on the other hand, say that, well, it doesn't really matter what you do. As long as your spirit's good, it doesn't matter what your flesh does at all. You can live however you want. Because it's not really you doing it, it's your body doing it. Some would say, but, but that came out of the core beliefs. If you're missing the point of the cross, you've still got to find some way to be holy. If you're misunderstanding what Jesus came to do, and misunderstanding the nature of, who, uh, of how creation works, then you end up living a sinful life and thinking it doesn't matter. <laughs> False teachers today rarely just flat out deny the importance of Jesus, but they take him off the throne. They turn him into a great teacher. Or they say that, uh, you know, as long as you're listening to those moral teachings, it doesn't really matter the rest of what you believe about him, as long as you, you try hard enough to be a good person. It's a new form of legalism. God through Paul is telling us it matters. And in order to get them on the right track, Paul starts with their understanding of who Christ is. And some would say that this is one of the most elevated views we have of Jesus in the entire New Testament. He, Paul writes to the Colossians, he says, he is the image, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. What we have believed in in faith came in the flesh so that we could see him and know him. And our images of him today may or may not be on point. <laughs> Some of them may be a little too fair-skinned. We actually found a children's Bible in which Jesus was actually blonde-haired and blue-eyed, and it was really like crazy-making to, to read it. But not on the cover. It wasn't until you opened up. It was but he came that we might see God. And he showed us. He says, to, he says to his disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He came and walked among us so that we wouldn't have to just rest in speculation about who God was. But to make it clear to us, this is the Lord. He is the firstborn of all creation. This is, this is a language around his position in creation. Uh, we see similar language in Revelation. Uh, in Revelation 3.14, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. It's the same language there as is here. Interestingly enough, we're going to hear more from Laodicea later in this book. And they're only about three miles apart. They're pretty close. Colossae and Laodicea were very close together. And he uses this, the same language that Paul uses with the Colossians. Jesus, in his letter to Laodicea, uses as well. The beginning of creation. 
It says, for in him all things were created. In Jesus, all things were created. He was with the Father in the beginning, as John tells us. All things in heaven, on earth, visible, invisible, thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. He's using language here, by the way, that uh, some of these false teachers, the Gnostics in particular, were using to describe these mythologies of different ranks of angels and, and heavenly beings and saying that Jesus was just one more of these uh, spiritual beings. Paul is saying, nope. He is in the beginning with God, and through him all things are created. He is before all things, and he is what is holding the universe together. He is the head of the body, the church. It's really interesting when, when scriptures talk about the church it's, it's not about this stuff, you know that? It's not about the planks, it's not about the bricks, it's about you and me being not just a, you know, we talk about a body of, of people today, we use that language because we got it here. It's not just that we're a collection of uh, different individuals who happen to show up here on the weekend at a slightly inconvenient time when we really could be sleeping. We are the body of Christ. You and me together are connected, not just because we showed up here this morning, but because of the spiritual reality of what is going on, that God is making himself known in the world now through his people, the church. You know, the old, the old uh, children's uh, nursery rhyme, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the doors, and where are the people? Uh, that's not a church. If there's no people. So unless your fingers are doing this in the middle of it, it's not a church. Even if it has a speak. We are the church. Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn as well from the dead. He is the first of the new resurrected humanity. He paved the way for what happens to the rest of us. You know we're going to be resurrected one day? We're going to join him. If he doesn't show up first before you and I pass and, 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 and takes us to be with him, if we pass away in this life, we are going to come back. <coughs> Heard from uh, uh, one of the ladies in the church this week that uh, was talking with a uh, funeral home director and said, uh, uh, whenever the, the resurrection of the rapture happens, the water level in Lake Clay is going to change dramatically. Because all of those who said, I really want to be cremated and dumped in there, those who are in Christ, God's going to be collecting that back up. We will be one day raised. And he is preeminent. He is the first and the utmost. Why? Because in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. He wasn't just some guy. Wasn't just one more good teacher. Wasn't just one more prophet, one more miracle worker. In him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. He is fully human, fully God. And through him, God reconciled all things to himself, things on earth, things in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That shed blood matters. That cross matters. He goes on to say, you who were once alienated and hostile in minds, doing evil deeds. That was all of us. At one point in time, we were separate from God. Whether we came to Christ at 4, 40, or 84, we at one time were separate.